Hi everyone. Sorry again that we're back online, especially since it's much more fun, frankly, for me to talk to you than it is for me to talk to my laptop. Um, so we are on with the show and we're moving on to lecture guide number three uh, on the Great Women Artists series. And we are going to start now by moving over to the United States uh, for a bit and looking at George O'Keefe's work. Uh, and then I'm going to move us back to Europe and we're going to look at a couple of artists associated with the most avant-garde movements in Europe in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Hannah Hock in Berlin Dada, uh, and a couple of artists associated with surrealism, primarily in France, uh, but also throwing in Frida Kahlo. Uh, and then we'll look at some mid-century artists associated with abstract expressionism and round it out with some early feminist artists. Um, and then next week we'll go on to later feminism and the explosion of kind of diversity and kind of wrap it up with some Northwest artists. And hopefully by that point, we will be back face to face. But in any case, if you're to go to the United States at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, well, you'd see a lot of things going on um, in the art scene, but it's worth mentioning that it's a, to me, it's always an odd phenomena that all through the 19th century in the United States, the importation of classical aesthetics, at least directly, really didn't work. Um, people didn't want the type of art that you see produced by the Renaissance and that was being produced primarily in France by practitioners of academic painting uh, at the time believing that classical art was too elitist and too European, frankly. And by the way, they, they also leveled that same claim against modern art that was seen as too esoteric and too, too European. In any case, this is the time that we get, well, frankly, we're, we're thinking about the second decade of the 20th century. You start to get the first, um, really strong teaching schools uh, devoted to the arts. They had been going on since the middle of the 19th century, but they're really, really becoming big names by this point. And those two big teaching schools are <clears throat> the Academy of Design in New York and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts in Philadelphia. And this is an artist associated with the academic tradition that was emerging in these schools at the time. Uh, an artist um, by the name of Kenyon Cox, who was also a writer, who really pushed the idea that classical arts was supposed to be, uh, again, the direct kind of embodiment of Western ideals and something that all artists should, should work at. Now, in this work called an eclogue, you know, basically what that meant at the time was idealized bodies, idyllic scenes of shepherds, you know, uh, kind of standard classical things. The alternative to this at the beginning of the 20th century in the United States, the, the kind of one movement that was particularly modern, although not really by the standards of European modernism, um, uh, was a movement represented here by the artist Robert Henry that became known as the Ashcan School. Um, it wasn't the label that they gave themselves. In fact, they didn't really have a formal name for themselves. Sometimes they were called the eight because of a show that they did together. But inspired by people like Thomas Aikens as an artist and by poets such as Ralph Waldo Emerson and frankly, uh, Whitman, uh, who pushed the idea of painting or creating art based upon your immediate experience and your own modern context. Artists like Robert Henry, who you see here in a work called West 57th Street, New York, really focused on the nitty gritty scenes of the world that they lived in and imported modern art styles, meaning things that drew attention to the fact that these are painted surfaces rather than just, you know, perfect idealized hyper-realistic scenes that, you know, minimize the trace of brushstrokes and so forth. Uh, and they were doing these again in as early as 1903, 1904, and continued um, right up into the time period that we'll be looking at with George O'Keefe. Again, in the United States, 
you know, it's some art forms were really well ex uh, uh, accepted, things like landscape painting, portraiture. Uh, and now, by this point, classical aesthetics is starting to be espoused by the New York Academy of Design and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts. Um, but modern art was something that was deemed too esoteric, too tied to the individuality of the particular artist, something that might work well for those Europeans, but couldn't possibly be imported to the United States, where we were interested in universal, kind of transcendent, um, aspirational art that was supposed to depict perfection and embody various values to which we could all say as humans we belonged. Again, the argument against modern art was, well, it's all these individual types. Yeah, there might be something interesting about a Van Gogh, but frankly, that guy's kind of crazy and his art is a product of his own individual psyche. And while it might be an amusement for us to look at that and say, wow, isn't that weird? It really doesn't do what art's supposed to do, which is to embody these universal timeless values as classical art did. So if you're a modern artist, at the beginning of the 20th century, without any other venues to show art, Museum of Modern Art is not going to be around for another almost 15 years. One of the things that you might strive to do, and this is what the Ashcan School and others put together, is to introduce the American public to the art of European modernism by putting on a huge show. And this one that you're seeing here is a show from 1913 called The Armory Show because it was held in the 69th Regimental Armory in New York in order to say, hey, here's what modern artists are doing. Here's why this stuff is interesting. If you just came in contact with more of it, you would like it as much as we do. And that would, by their, um, by their estimates, open the door to American artists who are interested in modernist ideas, including abstraction, um, to the American public who would say, wow, this stuff is really good. Let's support our local artist as well. That's the world that George O'Keefe is stepping into. And frankly, um, the American public was not either ready for it or really set up to distrust modernism. Here is an example of this on, um, you know, in the world, uh, a cartoon of people who have gone to the Armory Show, which, by the way, started in New York, stayed there for about a month, then went on to Chicago for a while, and then came back to the East Coast again, where the cartoonist points out that, you know, you can't make any sense of modern art, and if you really try hard, you might, if you look at the bottom little quadrant here, actually be debilitated. Deb debilitated so much that you have to be carted off in an ambulance to Bellevue Hospital. It can literally drive you insane, they're insane. This might be funny, and in some ways it is, but you should know that this is the exact same rhetoric that was used by the Nazis when they went after modern art, that it is the product of individual degenerate minds, and that uh, you know if you pay too much attention to it, your own psyche will be degenerated as well. So George O'Keefe then. Uh, I think everyone knows a little something about George O'Keefe. Um, it's important to me to point out that her early uh, artistic career was one in which up until the age of 25, she was basically moving to different artistic centers, Chicago, Amarillo, Texas, New York, and back and forth to these places over and again with the only aspiration being, frankly, as far as I can tell, that maybe she could become an art teacher. It did, just didn't seem possible that a woman who was interested in modern ideas was ever gonna be really a professional artist. At the very best, maybe you get some shows and you supplement uh, your teaching career. Her family life was difficult when she was 25 and it had been difficult for a while um, they didn't have very much money her mom dies or is dying of tuberculosis she'll eventually die a few years later she is again as i said traveling all around the united states basically either taking classes or picking up classes as a teacher as far away as amarillo texas chicago new york and eventually around the age of 25 26 she ends up in South Carolina for a teaching gig. Uh, 
By this point, she has come in contact with a lot of different ideas about what art should be. She hasn't really settled on them, but it's worth mentioning, for instance, she has um, read about Arthur Dow, uh, who is being taught to her by one of his colleagues. This is a major theoretician of modern art, um, who, along with Ernst Fenelosa, um, a I think he was an anthropologist at uh, Columbia or, or NYU, was working together with Arthur Dow to come up with an artistic theory that basically made the assertion that modern art could also be morally and ethically uplifting. This was the one thing that no one could quite make that argument, like it was just a bunch of pretty patterns, wasn't it? And they were saying, no, the relationship between the formal elements in a work of art, line, shape, color, and texture, and so forth, might be a model for social relations and came up with this really sophisticated idea that clearly appealed to George O'Keefe, who was very socially conscious, even if her art wasn't directly about social issues, and she never, by the way, adopted feminist stances in her art. In fact, she pushed them away, didn't want to be labeled a woman artist because she knew that that was marginalizing. Nonetheless, in her own mind, thought that art had to be doing something that was morally uplifting, and this was a very interesting theory to her. She also read, uh, Vasily Kandinsky uh, and his famous text concerning the spiritual in art, or Über das Geistige in der Kunst, which, again, Geistige or spiritual really in, um, in German means spiritual intellectual. And that is a text that's all about how the form elements of a work of art, again, its color, its line, its shape, its texture, its space, and so forth, should be thought of as a universal language of form that could communicate or express ideas directly beyond what those lines and shapes and forms were used to represent figuratively. Or another way to put this is, these were modern artists who were moving towards abstraction who thought, you know, one of the key components of all painting is that it's made up these basic building blocks, line, shape, color, and so forth, and that those basic building blocks could communicate or express something directly, like a poetic language, which is why so many of these modern artists, by the way, use the metaphor of music to talk about or to support their moves towards abstraction, making the assertion that just like music, which doesn't need to be recognizable, right? We don't need to put a name to a musical note or a, you know, a series of musical notes. We can just feel those and have it stir something inside us and realize that it's communicating, if that's the right term, at some level. Painting, sculpture, and so forth should be thought of in the same way as a series of notes, color, line, shape, texture, form, that can move us in ways that maybe aren't translatable back into words. She is, of course, these are some photos by Alfred Stieglitz, um, who uh, notices her work early in his career. There's a lot of misinformation uh, about this, a famous apocryphal story that Stieglitz saw her work and basically put it into a show without her knowing about it. That's not true at all. Uh, he knew her as early as 1915 her work and actually talked to her about putting on a show which he eventually did at the one modern venue in the United States at the time that was showing modern art that's his 291 galleries on uh, Fifth Avenue in New York while she's in South Carolina her her mother dies and she's again doing all this reading of things and she does some of her most abstract works to date that's what I'm showing you here now. These are some of her charcoal drawings, in which what she's primarily interested in is the interaction of these basic building blocks of, for instance, a jagged line on the left versus the curvilinear lines that parallel each other on the right and the bulbous forms kind of shooting up between them to communicate something, to express something, to be a facsimile of an emotional state. As a matter of fact, my famous quote, and maybe it's the most oft-quoted quote of George O'Keefe, goes like this. I feel that the real living form, and she's talking about something deep and uh, kind of eternal and um, uh, almost visceral, uh, 
is the natural result of the individual's effort to create the living thing out of the adventure of his spirit into the unknown. While where it has experienced something, felt something that it has not understood, and from that experience comes the desire to make the unknown known. By the unknown, I mean that thing that means so much to the person that he wants to put it down, clarify something he feels but does not clearly understand. Sometimes he partially knows why, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes it's all working in the dark, but it's a working that must be done. And the way I translate that is, we all know this thing, this is kind of fundamental to expressionism. There are these feelings or thoughts or, or kind of intuitions, perhaps is a word that we might use, that we have about the world, but they're not directly translatable into words or into rational justifications for what we feel. And poetic language, whether that be literary poetics, music, or in this case, the abstract form of painting and drawing, might be able to communicate those things to ourselves and to others without being reducible into words. And these are the charcoal drawings that she's doing, trying to explore, explore the abstract language of form. These are things that are done in 1915-16 when she's in South Carolina teaching. Right, simple abstract forms that somehow seem evocative of something without being representational. One of my favorites of this whole thing is this one, which she did, it's called Blue Lines from 1916. She did this uh, right after her mom died. And I mean, you know, you can imagine the facsimile here, but we've got two lines broad at the top, one that zigzags either away from uh, or towards another line and then kind of a, uh, foundation of the two drawn together. Now I could probably make up an analogy for this being a relationship to her mother or to her own feelings, uh, but you know that would just be my own interpretation and yours are just as, as interesting as mine. Some of her most famous works, and again, some of you will have seen these at the Seattle Art Museum, which uh, you know fairly frequently shows one of this series. Um, such as this, Music Pink and Lip Blue from 1919, again, right around the time that she gets her show at the 291 Gallery with Alfred Stieglitz, are actually works of art that are borrowing from this famous teacher, Arthur Dow, and his understanding of Vasily Kandinsky's writings on synesthesia. Synesthesia was a, a very important concept for modern painters who are moving towards abstraction. It's basically the concomitant concomitants of different senses and you know it's most obviously identifiable in people who frankly have had some kind of head trauma but not exclusively where someone might smell a color or see a sound and the the fact that this exists and that it was documentable led a lot of artists to believe that you could use for instance visual language to strike a deep chord within the interior of the viewer just like you know a uh, color could uh, bring forth a, a smell uh, or bring forth a sound in a viewer and so they they use this as justification uh, to create abstract form and the way that this works here is it's something that showed up in her certainly in her uh, art teaching and learning. Uh, she could have been introduced to this idea at the Art Students League where she took classes um, that were deeply inspired by Arthur Dow, where basically the instructor plays music and then asks the students to turn that sound into a visual equivalent. So in Music Pink and Blue, you can imagine the sounds that she's hearing and trying to come up with a visual equivalent for those sounds. I mean, pretty clearly we're, we're listening to something that's got some melodic uh, melody, some kind of repetition of form, something that's soft and maybe, you know, building in crescendo. It's almost assuredly not rap music, for instance. And here's just another one of those forms. Again, a lot of her forms, such as this one, gray line with black, blue, and yellow uh, of the 1920s are abstract shapes. 
abstract forms that are supposed to be equivalents of various emotional states or equivalents of some kind of experience that she's trying to translate into visual form. Um, she started to, though, and you can see this back with music, pink and blue, develop a pretty particular aesthetic in which you have a void or some kind of hollow in the center of things, such as here and here, that not long after, and especially when she was doing her flower paintings, got tied to actually feminine um, imagery, particularly kind of genital imagery. And if you're thinking this is crazy, this is out of the blue, this is the 1920s where surrealism and Freud are everywhere and everyone's trying on that. And it doesn't take much to start seeing these as kind of feminine labial folds or something like that. And since it's a woman artist, you know, you can see how this, this logic would come together. Now what Georgia O'Keeffe always said, and she said this even more when the feminists of the 1970s started really, really, uh, well, they started in the, the 60s, started really, really admiring her work is, that's not what's on her mind. She's not trying to represent female genitalia. Maybe this is kind of feminine energy that she's trying to represent, but it's not supposed to be representational. As a matter of fact, at the same time that she's doing things like that, she tries her hand at um, New York City uh, sky scenes, or at least urban landscapes, such as this one called City Night from 1926. Just so you know, this was all the rage in photography at the time. Alfred Stieglitz is doing this, and many other of the photographers that he supported were doing things like this. They're in, I find them very appealing paintings, but when George O'Keeffe did these, since everyone was familiar with this kind of work, and now you got this kind of work, they, um, you know, the, the gods of gender raised their head and said, this is not what, you know, you're known for. And frankly, it's too masculine. We think you're one of the greatest women artists. And we expect from your art soft pastels, soft forms, things that are associated with femininity and the, you know, strict rectilinear modern urban landscape with these sharp forms is masculine and you're stepping out of your realm. And even Alfred Stieglitz is doing this in his own work, basically pushed her away from this. And, um, you know, it didn't take long until either she believed them or just didn't want to fight that battle and moved on to the famous flower forms such as this. These are very appealing works. As most of you know, these are generally speaking, medium to medium small in size. Um, this is the Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, again, people looked at these and what I think she's actually trying to represent, which is one of the most uh, recurring themes in her work, is kind of um, fertility or the generative power of nature, which of course, if you look at a flower up close, has both sexual organs in it and is likely to make you think of that if that's where your mind's going. But she's not thinking of it that literally. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's kind of inevitable that you start looking at these, and she called this the psychological reading of her work, the red cana here, or famously black iris, which is hard to, you know, not see once you've rung that bell, so to speak. But again, she, what she wanted to say is, okay, well, let's say you do see that. That's not what was in my head when I was painting this. And what I always say is, well, it might not have been your head, but once you see this, you got to recognize people are likely to see this. And so where do I take it as an art historian? I take it into the realm of flowers are symbols traditionally of beauty, of sex and sexuality, of, you know, uh, the natural world's own kind of fecundity. And I think those ideas are certainly in her head when she does these extreme close-ups of the flowers. Which gets me to my other point, which is, she is, like so many modern artists, deeply influenced by photography, at least indirectly. The ability of a camera to get in really close or to look at things from oblique perspectives, which are not the perspectives of someone's traditionally standing at an easel looking at the world, uh, led to a lot of really interesting abstract paintings, and they certainly show up in her work. Back to this idea that one of the most kind of consistent themes in her work is the generative power of nature. If you look at this work called Cow Skull with Cow Skull with Calico Bones from 1941, you get what 
we might call a pantheistic view of nature. Pantheism is basically the idea that there is this kind of dynamic energy that is inherent in the world that sometimes, you know, some of another term for this is deism, but it's, it's pantheism is very particular to the, the ideas in the United States. Sometimes, especially in the 19th century, pantheism was directly associated with Christianity, the logic being that God made this world and there must be something of his perfection or dynamic energy in the world that continues to animate things. But that could also be thought of in a secular way of, you know, the world is ruled at some level by eternal forces of birth and growth and, you know, decay and death. And then from that energy comes more life. And in this kind of constant cyclical play of generative powers and decaying powers and so forth. And in a lot of her work, she'll see something like the coupling of flowers associated with fertility and fecundity and birth and sexuality with things like skulls, symbols of death and decay and so forth. Or for instance here, and by the way, there's that age-old, very important um, theme in 19th century landscape painting. In this work here called Black Cross with Red Sky, a little bit earlier work, you get that idea. There's something about the beauty of nature, which she responds to through her entire life, that is, you know, the beauty and the power and the mystery, all of these things that, as she said, are the unknown the, the stuff that you feel into it in nature that she wants to grapple with and make known through the process of her painting. And here, this, this again, very saturated red, intense red sky that's beyond any, any uh, you know, sunset or sunrise I've ever seen might speak to you about the, the kind of power of the universe and then this big black cross in the center, maybe linking this to Christian ideas about the, the power of God uh, and the sublimity of nature. Or this work here called Red Hill, I'm sorry, A Stump in the Red Hills, where you see mountains juxtaposed against, you know, this piece of wood that's decaying. And it can't help but make you think after a little bit of uh, looking at this about the process of growth and, and decay and you know, the fact that the entire universe is going through this kind of perpetual uh, cycle. A tree grows from a seed, it uses from the earth, then it returns to the earth. Again, same thing, bones with red hills. Now, one of my favorite paintings of hers, and she did a couple of these, it's called the Lawrence tree. It's named after her neighbors uh, in New Mexico and a tree that she actually, um, you know, sat underneath on summer nights and looked up at the stars. And, you know, on, on some level, all I want to do is say, look at how cool this is and whatever it calls to mind for you is, is good enough. We've all had an experience very similar to this where we've been sitting outside looking up through a tree and, and seeing, you know, the sky through it. That's one side. What I can offer to you as an art historian is just a simple thing to think about. This is very similar in my mind, in her own way, to Van Gogh's famous Starry Night, which you would have seen by this point. Um, and, you know, that cypress tree in the foreground that connects the sky to the earth. Here we've got a different view lying on her back where this stump almost looks like an umbilicus or a vein coming out of us, spreading out into the sky. There's a very interesting moment where if you look at the dark, which I take to be the canopy of the tree obscuring the sky, you can actually see through it in places and see the sky itself and wonder, you know, what this, this, this kind of interplay between positive and negative space is and how we're all kind of connected to each other and to the wider universe. You know, this, this very powerful idea of how everything is interconnected being represented through the abstract language or semi-abstract language of this painting. And, you know, you've probably seen 
uh, enough George O'Keefe's that you know uh, in the 40s when she is basically in New Mexico for most of her career and she's been estranged from Alfred Stieglitz, she does a lot of these types of paintings. This is Pelvis with Shadows and Moon, in which, once again, we've got this, this very strong thematic, a moon associated with life cycles, particularly menstrual cycles, very much a part of uh, mythology about uh, women's procreative powers here, but also with something that represents the other side of things, a pelvis that is just bone, so life's left this. And then along with all of that, this really beautiful abstract interplay of these forms and shapes and shadows and positive and negative space. Um, you know, a pretty interesting work. And just end with this, pelvis, red and yellow. That Again, impact of photography, being able to look at something really up close opens up the possibility to painters to say, I don't need to look at this from a fixed distance far away. Maybe if I looked at this thing really up close and, and you know, used that kind of change of perspective, I can generate some pretty interesting paintings. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick pause. You won't see much. I'll be right back in two seconds here. So let's move on to Germany now um, and look at one of my favorite artists, bar none, uh, male, female, doesn't matter to me. Um, this is going to be Hannah Hawk's work. Hannah Hawk here is on the right hand side and on the left is her fellow Berlin Dadas, Rao Hausmann. Hannah Hawk, who um, is associated, of course, with Berlin Dada, which needs to be explained a little, is famous for her collages, sometimes called photo montages, which are, as you would, I think, rightly assume, just cut images out of various magazines that are put together in various ways in order to communicate something about her understanding of the world in which she lives. The short story, because it's really, it's a class that I just taught last quarter that was an entire class on Berlin Dada, um, is very complex, starts with what's going on at the time in Germany. Following World War I, many of you know, Germany was uh, in a bit of a shambles. The, uh, the, basically, the, the country kind of moves towards a almost totalitarian government with Friedrich Ebert and Ed Noska, his minister of war, kind of running things with the help of the Freikorps. Um, they are um, they're absolutely anti-communist and all of the Berlin Dadas that are you know m members of Berlin Dada are absolutely communist. This is before and certainly not Stalin's version of communism. The idea of working together and working for the common man was what they were interested in. And so all the Berlin Dadas really push towards you know, communicating something of their distaste uh, for their current circumstances and promoting things that they will align themselves with. Hannah Hawk, basically, in her work, and you're looking at here her most famous early work called "Cut with the uh, Dada Knife," sorry, "Cut with the Dada Kitchen Knife Through the Vast Last Weimar Beer Belly Cultural Epoch in Germany," usually better known as "Cut with the Kitchen Knife." What she does here is, and I'll just go back for a minute, this is it behind her to give you a sense of the scale. What she does is she divides this, this collage panel into quadrants. She had worked for years and continues to work uh, for the Berlin Illustrated Times, a magazine, um, doing some editing in one of their, uh, one of their areas. So she's very familiar with the way that advertising imagery is used along with words to communicate messages. But what she does here is she pulls those images and words out and recombines them in ways to, in these quadrants, point out the things that are up here in the right quadrant, anti-data, and over here on the other quadrant, pro-data, with Albert Einstein saying, hey, uh, young man, 
Dada is not a passing fad. That's what actually comes out of his mouth here in promoting Dada's ideas, which are seen as revolutionary and cutting edge, just like Einstein's theory of relativity. I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs of that one because it's very complex and you get bogged down. I want to pick some of the ones that are a little bit easier to understand with a little bit more kind of punch in the face imagery to talk about, including this one here, which is called The Beautiful Girl from 1920. Hannah Hawk um, was, I think, a little bit ambivalent about something that was happening in all of these kind of weekly periodicals that were suddenly all the rage because photographic imagery could be reproduced at a little bit cheaper cost. And so things like Time Life in the United States and in uh, Germany, these weeklies like the Berlin Illustrated Times started promoting imagery and advertising pitch towards, in this case, what they dubbed the new woman. The new woman was an independent woman, the woman liberated by, of course, Germany uh, giving women the right to vote uh, uh, just before this time. And of course, following World War I, where women, had, and this is kind of the universal story, isn't had worked in factories during World War I to support the troops were not gonna be put back into their home. So they were out in the workforce working in various venues, oftentimes secretarial jobs and so forth. This then was a woman who had a certain amount of money to spend and of course advertising chases the money and so one of the things that was promoted to women were of course the latest hairstyles, the right hair products, the right makeup, how to do your eyes, clothing, shape forming clothing and on and on and on. And as you know many historians have put it, someone like Hannah Hawk who like most women hadn't even had the, the kind of pop world of advertising pay them attention at all, must have on the one hand felt, you know, pretty interested in this. And on the other hand thought, oh, you're still reducing us to pretty objects of desire uh, for the rest of the world. So here in this work, what you see is of course the hair, you see the eyes over here, you see, you know, manicured hands, you see a woman sitting in the center uh, and what she's wearing, and this will show up in a lot of Hannah Hawk's work, is a kind of form-fitting undergarment that uh, was kind of like an early form of Spanx. And then around that, these plays on um, BMW and manufacturing items and cars and so forth, probably a little nod to the idea that, you know, when something like cars are sold to men, what do they do? They accompany them with beautiful women sitting on their hoods or pointing to them in auto shows. After all, the woman here, her head is a light bulb, which on the one hand should reference the idea of, you know, an idea, and on the other hand is just a stupid light bulb. Or here, even more kind of to the point, dot dandy, is a conglomeration of different things that are being marketed to women. The right eyes, the right jewelry, the right handbag, the right shoes, right? With all of these things, you can go out and be the modern independent woman. But of course, it's just this kind of fictitious realm of masquerading that is pitched to women because frankly, they are now uh, a kind of consumer force to be reckoned with. This interrogation of the, the visual culture in which she lives is something that she'll return to over and over again. Uh, and one of the easiest ones to explain to people is this pretty straightforward work called um, uh, The uh, Bourgeois Wedding Couple Quarrel, or Po, a spat. And what we have here is a woman, again, who is wearing those kind of undergarments that are meant to to form her to the correct shape, I suppose, of the modern woman. She's wearing her modern kind of walking boots, standard fare for any woman who is being independent, but her head has been reduced to an infant's head uh, who's kind of crying off into the distance. Her partner, the other member of the bourgeois wedding couple, is, um, you know, it's originally an image of an athlete but this athlete seems to be laboring under either being feminized by this big woman's hat. In other words, 
a woman's independence threatens his masculinity or he's burdened under her need for uh, you know, greater fashion and spending more money. In any case, in the background, one of the most interesting things here is if you get in close, you'll notice, and this becomes standard fare for advertising, something that we call, borrowing from uh, Mark's uh, commodity fetish, is on her realm behind her sausage grinders, right? So that basically what you're saying is something like, if you get the latest, greatest sausage grinder, after all, we're in Germany, your life will be much easier and you'll be able to be out there on the town being an independent woman with your own job and still be a good woman in the home. Coupling this with the latest, greatest, uh, you know, washing machine, which by the way is directly connected to basically her reproductive organs, saying something like, is it a pun on the idea of menstruation or is it saying women because you you know, you can give birth and you're supposed to nurture life. You also have to nurture and clean the entire household. But in, in any case, right, if you get these things, your life will be better. And in his realm, of course, what do you have? Tools. A lot of her work is very political, though, too. In fact, one of the most important things that the Berlin Dottis did was to create political um, art to really correct for some of the, the problems of the, uh, the world that they lived in. Um, this work is uh, one of her most famous, pretty straightforward works that is called Heads of State, started in 19, probably 19 or so, and finished in 1920. The man on the left is Friedrich Ebert. He was basically the chancellor of the time, and the man on his right is uh, Gustav Noska, who is the minister of war, who basically keeps the people who are in power during Weimar in power through his own standing police force, as well as his ability to hire this basically mercenary group known as the, the Free Corps. Um, and so these are two pretty hardcore guys in the government of Weimar at the time who nonetheless look kind of weird. They're wearing their bathing suits and you see this kind of um, hand-drawn scene of a what looks like a beach and women with parasols and pretty birds and butterflies and so forth. You know, what is Hanahok getting at here? Well, you have to get to the original place that these images came from. And again, from our standpoint in time, not being a part of this German society, we aren't surrounded by these weekly periodicals. We don't know where this came from, but let's say 90% of the people at the time would have, and they would have immediately recognized that these two cutouts come from the cover photograph on the Berliner Illustrated Zeitung, the Berlin Illustrated Times, of these two characters and this was the entry into a 15 page um, pictorial kind of essay that had a really straightforward message, which was to humanize these two pretty hard hitting political leaders. Or another way to put this is that these guys, along with the government, basically paid for a photo spread where they were up in the mountains of Germany acting like everyday guys going swimming, drinking beer, hunting, you know, uh, doing whatever they're doing, just like everyone else would do as a man in order to make them seem more relatable. And what she does is she cuts these out. Everyone would have known this original photo spread and she puts them into this fictitious background as if to say, this is all a form of the aestheticization of politics a way to create propaganda. It's just a beauty pageant. It's all make-believe, it's all fictive. And the very interesting thing, of course, of collage is once you see this kind of critique of the original image, it doesn't just give you this kind of picture here. It makes you critical of everything you see going forward when it comes to these illustrated political messages in uh, the various uh, periodicals of the time. Now we'll just uh, uh, end with this work. The other big thematic in Berlin Dada is the, the way that big corporations supported wars because it's a way for them to make a lot of money off producing uh, 
uh, weaponry and munitions and so forth. It's one of the ways that a lot of people got rich during World War I in Germany. As a matter of fact, BMW, which he's already highlighted in that earlier work, really becomes a huge corporation by creating engines for uh, boats during World War I. And then one of the things that happens following World War I is that all of these big corporations and factories are forced by the rest of the European powers to retool to create standard consumer items rather than implements of war, which they all do, uh, at least to some degree, including BMW, that makes them kind of the corporation that they are today. But the, the suspicion was that most of these corporations and the heads of these corporations would want to retool their factories to produce war implements again, because there's a heck of a lot more money in that. And frankly, that's what happens uh, under Hitler and the rise of national socialism. What we see here is this worry. It's called a high finance. And in the center, we have these two fat cat industrialists with various heads on them. One that's a very famous industrialist in Germany. The other is actually um, a, a British chemist who is associated with photography, who she's included because, you know, there's this kind of implicit uh, support of uh, basically consumerism and politics as they exist during this time because of the advances of photography. But in any case, both of these figures who are associated with um, this, this, this coalition or this, this kind of um, intersection of big business and war or what Eisenhower eventually would call the military industrial complex literally have guns on their mind. And what they're doing is they're beside factories over here that are now producing, we can see here, standard consumer items like tools and cars and trucks and tires and what have you. But hovering in the background are a couple of things that people at the time would have noticed, including this red, white, and black flag associated with the empire of Germany, not contemporary social democratic Germany, a time period in which Germany is very, very warmongering, very, very powerful, very, very based in the idea that the strength of Germany is what you rely on, not any kind of diplomacy, which is picked up again on this photograph you see underneath them. These, this is an aerial photograph of the Centennial Fairgrounds in Breslau, Germany, that was created, this huge fairgrounds to commemorate the 100-year victory, um, the centennial uh, of their victory over Napoleon. In other words, it was a moment of Germanic might through their military, something that was greatly celebrated, tied to nationalism, that is part of this military industrial complex that will be harnessed, and they're absolutely right, almost 10 years later, when Hitler rises to power, and says, hey, Germans, stop being, uh, you know, the patsies for these Europeans. Stop rolling over and pretending that you're soft. We're a proud, strong Germanic uh, group. We are proud of our military might in the past. Let's get back to that time. And offers these industrialists the chance to cash in on it by allowing them first secretly and then with no secret at all to retool these factories back to producing weaponry. Again, this is being produced, and many works like this, 10 years before Hitler gains the chancellery in Germany. It's a warning tale. Now, fairly briefly, but just to let you know that they're, they're out there, there were a number of women that were associated with surrealism. Surrealism is the movement that really gets going just slightly after Dadaism. In fact, surrealism actually comes out of uh, Dada in Paris, but the women artists of this period never reached the same kind of level of fame as the male artist, um, you know, which is predictable, but partially because of the way that women were thought of in surrealism. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Instead, what I want to start with is this idea of giving you a sense of what surrealism was all about before it just became synonymous with someone like Salvador Dali and Melting Clocks. On the Surrealist, what you're looking at here is a, a portrait of André Breton, who is the leader of Surrealism, 
by the French artist André Masson. Breton had worked in, during World War I as an army medic, and he ended up working in kind of the psychology department, uh, trying to administer to people who were suffering with what was known at that time as shell shock syndrome. Um, today we know this better as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and what they were trying to do was apply Freudian ideas to help people out, or at least partially Freudian ideas. When he was studying these ideas, one of the things that was relatively new, or a new way of thinking about the human psyche, was that you could divide it into a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. The subconscious was something that had huge impact on our co conscious mind and our decisions, but was, by its very nature, not something that was conscious. So what Breton thought would be a really important thing for a, a, a modern art movement to do would be to tap into the subconscious mind and raise it to the level of consciousness so that we could study it, come to terms with it, make better, um, make better decisions based upon knowing how that subconscious worked. He thought, for instance, that rationality in the West had been very thoroughly examined and elevated and explored. But here was this new thing that no one had thought to even think about before that needed similar exploration. So for the Surrealists, what they tried to do by and large was tap into the subconscious mind, even more particularly the most kind of um, primal part of the subconscious mind, what Freud called the id, raise that to consciousness and fuse it with consciousness to create a surreality or overarching reality. So the key was various techniques to tap into the subconscious mind. Um, one huge idea in surrealism was what Breton called psychic automatism. Psychic automatism is basically allowing the subconscious to emerge in a very relaxed state and to observe what was going on uh, in the subconscious automatic state. In fact, he once described or defined surrealism this way. Surrealism is, quote, pure psychic automatism by which one intends to express verbally in the form of writing or by any other method the real functioning of the mind Dictation by the thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason and beyond any aesthetic or moral preoccupation. And what he means there is, don't censor yourself. The contents of your subconscious and your id are things to just allow to float to consciousness, make some sense of them, and learn from it. The visual equivalent for psychic automatism was known as automatic drawing, which you're looking at here, where an artist just puts themselves into a very relaxed state and allows their hand to freely con create any kinds of symbols or imagery that it wants, and then they would study this to try to gain some insight into the subconscious mind. Another idea, though, about, and this is one of the reasons that women weren't really um, quite as prominent in surrealism as the male artists. In fact, they were oftentimes just thought of as artistic muses. They called them femme enfants. The terrible femme enfant was a almost like a naive woman child who was innately more in touch with her subconscious and those impulses and thus didn't need to practice psychic automatism, but also couldn't actually express that psychic automatism directly. What was open to them was another avenue, one that many of them took known as, well, there's no real way to put it. It's what the Surrealists called the marvelous. The marvelous was a radical juxtaposition of two things that were not really expected that could knock one into or, or kind of evoke for the viewer a sense of their subconscious. It comes from the Freudian idea of the unheimlich, or the uncanny, which uh, Freud points at uh, saying that it's a, a basically a repressed feeling or experience that exists deep in one's un unconscious that can be evoked by something that is completely unexpected. Unheimlich literally means unhomely. So it's something that you already have known it's kind of right there on the fringe, and then something sparks it into recognition. 
And what the Surrealists believed is that radical kind of juxtaposition of things that were not expected could produce this feeling of what they called the marvelous, what Freud called the unheimlich, what frankly their, their, um, their kind of cultural um, icon, the Comte de Lautremont, who's also known as Isabel, uh, or I'm sorry, Isidore Ducasse, once described with this statement. He said, it's as beautiful as the chance encounter of an umbrella and a sewing machine on an operating table, which always struck me as incredibly poetic and very strange, and of course, exactly what they're getting to. So when you're looking at this work here, which is uh, by Merritt Oppenheim, uh, that's called Objet or Object from 1936, you get that it's a teacup and a spoon and a saucer that have been covered with beautiful fur. And it apparently came out of a conversation she had with uh, Marcel Duchamp uh, about how odd this would be. Or talk about the perfect kind of fetishized object. This is Merritt Hoppenheim's work called My Nurse, which again, you get to make whatever you want out of this. It's shoes, a standard fetish, trussed up, another fetish, but made to look like some some you know poultry dish that has been baked and then attached to the idea of a nurse whatever that's supposed to be and these again were these what they called the strange object or the the unheimlich object that could spark you into contemplation of the marvelous and somehow bring you into the depths of your subconscious this is uh picasso's uh portrait of dora marr Dora Maar was a famous photographer of the time, uh, uh, someone who helped Picasso out, by the way. He's having an affair with her at the time that he created Guernica, and she was a collaborator on that famous painting. And some of her photographs that are most well-known are things like this, Per Ubu, which are composite photographs of various different, in this case, animals juxtaposed together seamlessly spliced and then photographed again to create these strange kind of alien creatures. Or this one, Hand in Shell, that looks like something that came out of a Twilight Zone uh, episode. I can just imagine instead of a hermit crab, you know, coming out of a, a shell at some time, this strange manicure hand coming out of that shell. Again, these were created using um, you know, it's well in advance of Photoshop. It's composite imagery. So the artist would take a photograph of a shell with a hand in it, and then a photograph of a sky and splice these together and then photograph it again, uh, or splice together the negatives and uh, print it to create this image that is, you know, strange enough to spark you into a contemplation of your subconscious. The most famous, perhaps, of the Surrealist women artists is someone who didn't think of herself as a Surrealist at all, Frida Kahlo. And this is her next to Diego Rivera, uh, her, her husband for a while, uh, who was, of course, the famous Mexican muralist and uh, was very close to the Surrealist at the time because the Surrealist had gravitated towards communist ideas or Trotskyist ideas, and Diego Rivera was very interested in that. Frida Kahlo, for her own part, did not think of herself as a surrealist, and I certainly don't either, even though, um, you know, her imagery is strange enough that you would immediately think, oh, this has got to be about surrealism. It's not for me because, um, frankly, her work isn't about really dealing with or expressing her subconscious so much as it is creating images based upon her own uh, understanding of her state. They're primarily her work is about herself uh, and her own experience. So here is a work known as uh, My Nurse and I uh, from 1937, right around the same time period, a little bit later, that Breton uh, notices her and puts her in shows and labels her as a surrealist. And it's a theme that shows up a lot in her work. Um, she came from, uh, obviously, she's a Mexican uh, woman. She came from a culture that is very divided between various social classes. She actually comes out of a fairly bourgeois class. But Diego Rivera was always pushing her to really kind of delve into to, uh, more kind of native cultures of Mexico rather than the more uh, bourgeois westernized cultures that she grew up in. Um, much of which was represented for her by the culture of Tijuana, 
which was a, a very powerful independent view of women that was premised upon this, the, the stature of women in these earlier Mayan, Aztec, and so forth cultures. And so here you see her in her very, very white dress nursing from the teat of this figure who represents the powerful force of kind of indigenous cultures of, uh, of her modern Mexico. One of her most famous images as well is based upon her own experience. This one's called Broken Column. I bet you many of you are familiar with this. Uh, early in her life, she was hit by a basically a bus, a trolley, and it, it really, really damaged her physically as well as emotionally. She went underwent many operations to try to repair the damage that it caused. In this work called Broken Column, you see that kind of the center of her is crushed and broken and she's all kind of cobbled together with these these nails that aren't really functioning to hold her together and just make us feel the the prick of these nails and that pain that must be ever present with her that you know she had to live with uh, her entire life this kind of pain it also made her infertile which she believed caused a lot of the alienation that she had with her husband, uh, Diego Rivera, who had numerous affairs with her and eventually they split up. Finally, I wanted to um, just show you this work, maybe her most famous image called the Two uh, Fridas, two representations of Frida Kahlo. On the right hand side is the Frida Kahlo associated with Tawana culture, the powerful indigenous uh, woman dressed in traditional garb. On the left-hand side is a more bourgeois Frida Kahlo dressed in all of her white finery. She holds in her hand on the left, or rather with forceps, a vein that connects the two Fridas together, but it's pouring out on the very kind of weakened bourgeois Frida Kahlo, uh, who's got a heart that seems in tatters. And on the right-hand side over here, you've got a powerful, healthy heart, a figure who's umbilicus or vein goes down to a little cameo image of Diego Rivera, who is pushing her towards this independent Frida Kahlo. So then, let me again take a quick pause to get a drink of water and take a break, and I will be right back with you with minimal impact, I hope. In the middle of the 20th century, uh, during the abstract expressionist movement in the United States, represented here by Jackson Pollock next to Peggy Guggenheim holding her ever-present uh, little dogs, um, you know, a number of women artists actually gained a great deal of, let's say, secondary fame. They were never deemed as important as the male artist Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko or any number of them. Um, and frankly, the language used by critics such as Clement Greenberg were partially to blame for that. Um, they emphasized things like the virility of the form of the painting, the strength, its assertiveness, terminology that didn't really lend its well to um, you know, standard stereotypical views about what femininity were. Um, but nonetheless, they did attain a great deal of fame and frankly, you know, if you think about this story, I'll just kind of emphasize this. Um, it is, you know, the 1940s into the 50s. Most of these women, um, you know, were coming of age well before the rise of any serious form of second wave feminism. Uh, they really believed, as you see here, Lee Krasner taking Jackson Pollock by the hand, that their role was to support a man. They honestly believe every single one of these artists that I'll be talking to you about, Lee Krasner, Joan Mitchell, Helen Frankenthaler, that, that, that nothing really was getting in their way as a woman artist, that there was no reason to be doing anything specific for the cause of women to, to raise their equality level, that they were just going to keep kind of toiling away at being an artist, not recognizing that they were, or not caring that they weren't going to achieve the same fame as their male contemporaries, or being okay with that. 
Lee Krasner, for her part, literally put her career on hold because Jackson Pollock was, frankly, such a mess, um, uh, you know, most of his life being an alcoholic and maybe having a, a few other things going on. Um, she thought that this was the right thing to do. She continued to believe that she made the right decision through her entire life, saying he was the genius. He was the one who had a lot of problems and wouldn't have uh, attained his his uh, fame or all the breakthroughs that he made without my support, and I was more than happy to do that. And of course, what we're talking about here are things that moved American painting into the full realm of abstraction, such as this painting here by Pollock, which he created, again, drawing from surrealist ideas of psychic automatism in his studio in uh, upstate New York, or I'm sorry, on Long Island, uh, painting scenes, uh, you know, by dripping paint on unprimed canvases. Of course, these women were right in the mix. Uh, here is Clement Greenberg, the most important critic of this day, with Jackson Pollock, Helen Frankenthaler, Lee Krasner, sharing ideas at the Cedar Cat Tavern, going to the art club in Manhattan. Lee Krasner, for instance, took classes uh, uh, with some of the most prominent uh, artists of her day, the most important teacher, Hans Hoffman. She probably actually had more complex conversations with Clement Greenberg about artistic theory than uh, any of the male contemporaries at this time. But of course, it was the male artist who looked like the bad boys of film culture of this time, uh, were the ones who lived hard and died young, like Jackson Pollock, who got all the fame. Here is Lee Krasner in her studio, and, um, you know, early works by Lee Krasner, such as this one here, that is an untitled work from 1949. So at the same time that Pollock's getting famous, she's doing these really complex, almost ideograms that look suspiciously like things that people like Willem de Kooning are doing roughly at the same time period, but she puts it on hold to support him. And then when she comes back later in her career, she's producing works like this uh, called Gaia from 1966, which is meant to evoke the spirit of the feminine power of the universe, these pink forms, the name Gaia, who's the original Greek god of agriculture, huge, huge, powerful uh, works that, uh, you know, even though she had put her career on hold for 10 years or so, uh, were enough to make her a good living and are really worth seeing if you like abstract paintings of this era. I will point you to the Seattle Art Museum, which at this time, of course, just got a new um, collection uh, promised to them and is on display and has, for the first time, a really nice uh, Lee Krasner work, a really nice Joan Mitchell work, a really nice Helen Frankenthaler work. So make sure you go see this. This is Joan Mitchell's work here. She was working the majority of her uh, kind of uh, mature career in Paris, and so she didn't get quite the same uh, play in the United States as her male contemporaries. There's not a ton for me to say about these works. She seems to be caught up in ideas about creating beautiful interlocking patterns. Uh, if we were in front of these in the Seattle Art Museum, I could talk about these forever, but you know, looking at images of these paintings and not seeing the texture, not seeing the interplay of little brush strokes and so forth, and kind of leave something to be desired, but definitely go check these things out. One of the big things that I wanted to say about all of these artists, and, and this is one more uh, Joan Mitchell from the mid 60s called uh, Maple Leaf Forever, uh, is that none of them really wanted to be thought of as women artists and none of them wanted to use their art to make, let's say, the art world a, an easier place for next generations of young women artists, um, they shied away from that. They thought that art was universal, that yeah, maybe they weren't getting quite the same attention as male artists, but they certainly weren't going to use their art to draw attention to that because that would marginalize them. Another way to put this would be to say that even though they may have seen some of the inequities in the world, and especially the art world, 
they weren't going to use their art about that. Their art was just going to be kind of turning a blind eye to that. And that'll be something that changes with the next generation of young women artists, those who come of age in the late 50s to the early 60s rather than in the 40s and 50s. Helen Frankenthaler is a little bit easier to talk about here because like this work here, um, and we've got something very similar to this right now up in the Seattle Art Museum. This one's Mountains and Sea from 1952, so pretty early on. Helen Frankenthaler was one of the first to really stain her canvases. In other words, what she did, which was seen as revolutionary by artists, was to take painting one step further in modernist terms towards the essentializing of the two-dimensionality of a canvas. I know this, for those of you who never heard these ideas before, it must sound crazy that anyone ever thought that the most important thing for a painting to do was to reduce itself to its essential characteristics, but this was a key idea under modernism and something that was espoused by the great critic Clement Greenberg. And so when an artist like Pollock dripped all over the canvas and it was completely abstract and just seemed to be referring into itself, that was seen as really, really modern. The next step was to say, we can't even see the tactile quality of one skein of paint over the next. Instead, the painting is literally fused with the canvas, making it even more two-dimensional, two and this is thus better. And she's one of the first to do that. Her interest here uh, at this time was to create a expression of her feeling of the landscape and the sea. She had spent a summer in Nova Scotia kind of sucking up that ambience. And then when she would go to her studio, she just felt like she was so imbued with these feelings that she almost like an automatic drawing, just let them all pour out onto the canvas to express that inner state. This one's called Small's Paradise, again, a very similar one to this that we now own at the Seattle Art Museum. Again, the stained canvases well before Mark Rothko did these and or right around the same time period anyway. And this one called Flood from 1967, which got her in a show with very famous male contemporaries like Morris Lewis that was doing something very similar, but on a grander scale. Um, you know, she was plenty famous. Her works are incredibly important as kind of visual um, evocations of the, 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 you know, the environment that she was trying to express. They're also very, very tied to the last gas of high modernist abstraction. While those artists are working, a younger generation of women artists are coming through the ranks, and these are women who um, are kind of noting some of the equities of the art world. They are tied to different traditions, not traditions of painting per se, but some of the alternative venues that were cropping up in New York at the time associated with movements like fluxes and happenings, um, things that were very open to experimentation, and of course, many of them thought that the way that women were treated in the world was just outright wrong and they were going to use their art to say something about it, to either raise consciousness about the issues or to revalue and redefine some of the ways that women have been defined under patriarchy. One of those artists is Yoko Ono, um, who was uh, in the United States um, with her husband at the time, got a loft in New York City, which hosted a ton of activities, including a lot of fluxus activities. She was back and forth between New York and Japan for a while, where she had been born. And her most famous work is a work called Cut Piece. Now, I'll ask those of you who are interested in this to go look this up on YouTube or anywhere else that you find it just by doing a Google search and watching the very, very raw footage of this event. And what she did here is that she sat on stage, she did this a number of times, by the way, sat on stage wearing her favorite outfit, so something that she was, she really liked and would cost her something to lose. And then she invited audience members to come up and with some large fabric shears, cut off any piece of her clothing that they wanted and take it with them while she remained entirely passive. Now, at the time that she did this, she was talking a lot to other people about her own family trauma growing up in Japan, 
an overbearing mother, a kind of absentee father, very rigid. Of course, Japan during World War II and the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that kind of trauma as well. Um, and, you know, putting herself into a very kind of uh, fraught situation so as to re-experience at least partially the feeling of anxiety and work her way through trauma. But very quickly, a lot of feminists of the time noted that what she was doing as well is putting herself in front of an audience and authorizing them to come act out in any way they wanted towards her might manifest various kind of implicit biases and aggressions towards women that already existed in the world. And when you see the, uh, the video footage of one of these in New York, you really get that sense because she sits there passively and people will come up and cut a little clothing off and then another one cuts a little bit more off and then another one cuts even more off and gets very aggressive and kind of uh, uh, very uh, theatrical about himself being on stage and you know acts in a certain way cutting more and more of the clothing off and then the crowd actually kind of boos him and hisses at him and and says things about what he just did and the next person up cuts a little bit less clothing off so what I'm getting at here is that feminists then interpreted this work, and I think rightly so, as something that's even more interesting than, you know, Yoko Ono working herself through her personal trauma, as something that authorizes behaviors in the confined space of a gallery where people act, you know, the way that they want to act and then get feedback from others as to what is an appropriate action. And so, for instance, what you might think is until someone says, you know, we didn't even have a term for uh, 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 any kind of, you know, sexual assault or, uh, you know, inappropriate sexual behavior comments in the workplace until like the 1970s. Until someone says, hey, stop patting me on the butt or it's not appropriate for you to call me darling or cutie or, or ogle me or whatever. Um, you know, that behavior doesn't change. In other words, society authorizes various treatments of people. And here we have a situation in which those treatments, in this case, a kind of sexual aggression towards women, given the opportunity a man will cut as much of her clothing off as he can get away with, can make those visible. Another artist of the same time period working in the same kind of circle of artists associated with Judson Dance, John Cage, Fluxus, Happenings, and so forth, is this artist, Carolee Schneeman. And I could show you a million works by Carolee Schneeman. I really like her, but I'm just going to focus on this work called I Body. Carolee Schneeman is a young woman, was a dancer. Um, she decided after doing some collage work, which you see in the background here, kind of installation collage, that one of the things that was missing in the history of representation of women was basically what we would today call sex positivity. In other words, women could be represented over and over again as objects of desire for heterosexual men, but they were always objects. And it was always believed, at least implicitly, that women were there for men sexually, but men weren't really there for women. As a matter of fact, it might surprise many of you that there was a ton of false kind of junk science out there that said that women didn't really have a sexual drive, that it was always only responsive to male sexuality. And thus, you know, uh, you see these representations that are primarily meant to provoke male sexual or desirous responses, but really didn't take into account at all women as sexual beings in their own right. So what she took to do here is this is, these what you're going to be looking at here are photographs of a performance in which as a live female figure, she acts out very provocative, very uh, um, kind of, um, you know, beautiful poses that might be associated with other representations of women as objects of desire in either paintings or in films or in magazines, but she's a real live figure. And so you in the performance space with her would have had to confront her as a live human being who, unlike a photograph or a movie, could at any moment look back at you had to be understood as a real human being. 
And part of the things that she is using in her imagery, such as this, where you see a, a toy snake on her leg and one that she's kissing up here, is to draw attention to some of the stereotypes of, that have framed female sexuality. For instance, the first thing that you might think of with a woman with a snake is Eve in the Garden of Eden, where female sexuality is framed by the interpretation of that story by Christians as something that is a temptation to be avoided, something that is going to be the downfall of man, something that eventually leads to the you know crucifixion of Christ, even if you want to take it there. Like that's all what is framing female sexuality as a temptation, as something that's nefarious and not to be trusted. But along with that, it's worth noting that, you know, a lot of these women artists, these early feminist uh, artists in the United States were becoming more and more aware that tra traditions of Christianity had, of course, displaced earlier religions that are, broadly speaking, earth religions, in which female sexuality wasn't a bad thing, but something that was very closely associated with the generative forces of the universe, of woman as a kind of microcosm of the cycle of birth and death and decay that we talked about with George O'Keefe. That, for instance, snakes in Minoan culture, which you see here in this figurine on the right, where you've got a snake goddess, as they call her, some member of the priesthood, that is holding these snakes, those snakes, pre the way that they were framed by Christianity, were associated with death and life because we know their venom can kill you, but that venom was also used, as it still is today, as something to cure people of various ailments. That snakes, because they spiral themselves up to keep warm, and the spiral is a symbol of the cyclicity of life or symbolic of that, and they shed their skin, a symbol of rebirth, were powerful symbols for these earlier religions, spiritual traditions, in which women's status was very, very highly esteemed, and where the importance of, of basically controlling female, female sexuality was not as important because most of these cultures were matrilineal. Let me say this again. One of the big arguments from a lot of feminists is that one of the reasons that female sexuality is so tightly circumscribed in our Western society is because controlling who the birth father is is very, very important. But if you live in a matrilineal society, all the inheritance is passed down through the female line, so who the father is doesn't matter so much. In any case, the big point is there's a big difference between looking, having been to a million performances myself, looking at a live body moving and provocatively posing itself and looking at, for instance, a Bouguereau painting of a beautiful woman. The one on the right, my argument is, is about your desire as a heterosexual man or frankly, anyone who stands in front of it. She doesn't look back at you. She turns her gaze away. You're not going to be thinking about who is Venus and what is she thinking and what does she want from me? She is just there to provoke your desire. Whereas the possibility exists when you look at a real human being active provocatively, she could always turn you down. She could always say, hey, what are you looking at? She's always there to be recognized as a real human being rather than an object. She's a sexualized individual rather than a sexualized object. And this is one of the ways that Carol Lee Schneeman, again, sought in this and many other works to change the way we think about female sexuality from something that either is non-existent or dangerous to something that is sex positive. Another early feminist artist from roughly the same time period is Mary Beth Edelson. Um, she did both performances as well as standard paintings and collages. Um, one of her most famous collages, which was at the Seattle Art Museum a couple of years ago, so maybe a couple of you saw this, was based upon this precedent, um, Leonardo da Vinci's famous Last Supper. She collaborated with a number of her peers in New York, poets, visual artists, and what have you. She asked them and work called a collaborative series called 22 Others to offer her ideas that then she would create herself in her own manner. Collaboration, by the way, was something that a lot of early feminists 
sought in their own work, believing that the idea of the genius male artist toiling away on his own in his studio was very tied to kind of outdated ideas of creativity and masculinity. And so drawing from the power of the community was something that a lot of these early feminists really espoused. One of the, the uh, suggestions was to take on organized religion and say something about it. And so what she did is, in the center of this work called Some Living American Women Artists Last Supper, is she took out all of the male heads of the Leonardo da Vinci and pasted on them female heads of famous women artists during her day. And in the center, of course, is George O'Keefe. Then let's see, who else have we seen already in this class? Um, this is Lee Krasner here. This is Helen Frankenthaler here. Um, this is Yoko Ono over here. Then around the exterior of this uh, are the portraits and the names are actually down here below, a key to all the names of the rest of the 99 women practicing artists during her day. And two things happen here that are important. The first is, imagine a world in which every day when you wake up, all of the key historical figures, the main figures in the religions, the every president who's ever been in the United States were not men, they were all women, right? How different would that world be? And I don't mean just practically, like what decisions would have women made that are different than those made by men, although, you know, that would be an interesting uh, thought experiment. The bigger one is what would it be like to wake up as a woman and look around the world and say, I have the possibility of being any one of these things because it has happened before and there's an endless series of examples of it. The other thing that's happening here is she's making visible the fact that there are even a hundred practicing women in the United States at this point as artists, which might've taken a lot of people by surprise. Her more famous, kind of installation performances are things that take on patriarchy and offer alternative versions of the long sweep of history, such as this one called A Memorial to Nine Million Women Burned During the Christian Era from 1977. She, like many early feminists and feminist artists, were looking into the question of how women have been framed historically and what existed before Christianity and how did that go away? They had very quickly learned, as I talked about just a moment ago with Carol Lee Schneeman, that a lot of early religions really place women in positions of high authority and that those positions of high authority in the spiritual realm oftentimes mapped on to very prominent positions in society. These are early, primarily earth religions, although not exclusively those. So then the question became, well, how did these get stamped out? And what she came across over and again is that they were, of course, these earlier traditions recast by monotheistic tra traditions, including Christianity, as heretical. So that, you know, the term we have for a Wiccan culture is witches, uh, a pejorative that is labeled at anything that is seen as heretical and tied to these earlier earth religions. Wiccan culture, of course, and homeopathic healing are the vestiges of earlier cultures, spiritual and, and healing traditions that Christianity systematically stamped out by labeling practitioners as witches and then, you know, executing them. A lot of executions all the way through the Middle Ages. So what's going on here? Well, what you're looking at here is the entry into the performance space for this, this performance that took place. And that entry has on its exterior, and by the way, every entry into a spiritual state is marked out by some kind of threshold. So here you've got that, that portal or that door. And on the exterior of this, are, you see this symbol here. That symbol is the symbol of the horns of consecration, which are also on the top. It's a symbol of male virility or male power, but this male virility was harnessed by Minoan culture, that culture of ancient Crete that I referenced with the snake goddess, uh, that was also matrilineal, and it was harnessed by female priestesses or members of the clergy. These 
hands, by the way, are all actually photographs of women artists and writers who contributed to a famous periodical called Heresies, uh, a kind of feminist art periodical in an uh, edition that was devoted to the idea of the great goddess. Great goddess is a Jungian archetype, the power of the universe of the feminine from which women can draw. When you, and I don't have a photograph of this, when you walk through on the other side of this were fig leaves. And I think the first thing I think about with fig leaves is that we use them to cover up genitalia, right? But believe it or not, that's also a Christian adaptation uh, which comes from the idea that the fig was being a very, very prolific fruiting tree, the fruit of the goddess. And then, you know, Christians basically took this and used it as a symbol of shame. Turning on the lights a little bit here, in the middle of this was a fire ladder around which is a circular table associated with collaboration and community. She took all of the books that, uh, or she made handmade books. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. These are a couple of pictures of Minoan Crete. This is the palace at Knossos. Some of you might have visited here. And if you look off into the distance here, right there, these are horns of consecration on that palace. And over on this side is something also uh, associated with their religion that I just threw in because I think it's really cool. It's a bull's head writing. It's actually a small little vessel that you use to pour libations during religious ceremonies. She, on the night of the performance, people entered the room and they chanted off the names of uh, people who had been executed for being uh, witches during the Christian era. There were statistics uh, that were from her own personal research that she recounted to the rest of the participants. Uh, there were handmade books created uh, that contained all of her research evidence. The handmade book was important not just because she was an artist and these are beautiful objects, but because she was trying to say the publishing industry that has been ruled by patriarchy won't even publish this information. Finally, again, one of the most iconic moments of feminism or early feminism in the United States happened on our own West Coast uh, with these two uh, kind of spearheading, spearheading the, the movement. This is Judy Chicago on the left and Miriam Shapiro on the right. They started the feminist art program first at Cal Fresno and then it moved up to basically Cal Arts for a short period of time. This was a, a program that basically was devoted to young women artists and kept men out, not because they thought men were horrible ogres, but rather as they, I think, very persuasively argued, they wanted women to have a kind of safe space in which they didn't even have to think about a masculine presence or a masculine kind of person judging them, whether the real man was judging them or not. Um, part of these, these this this uh, feminist art program, of course, developed a number of really important next generation feminist arts. And the big thing that Judy Chicago, right around this time, time period was hatching was her famous dinner party. And the dinner party, which now has a permanent place, but it took years for this to come to fruition at the Brooklyn Art Museum, is a huge table with 13 place settings on three sides in the shape of a triangle, an inverted triangle, which is a symbol of basically what Judy Chicago called central core imagery. Central core being vaginal or vulvic imagery associated with the most essential part of women, associated with her power and her procreative power. Very essentializing, of course, uh, but this was part of early feminism. Each of the 13 sides in chronological order uh, is given to um, or marked and devoted to a very important figure historically that patriarchy has not paid much attention to, starting with the snake goddess, so associated with Minoan culture again on this side, and moving around the table all the way to Georgia O'Keeffe over here. In the center on these tiles, there are the names of 999 other women in history that have not gained their due in patriarchy, written in gold uh, on, again, little triangular tiles. 
It was created collaboratively. Over 400 people worked on this over the years that it took to make this. Again, collaboration being a form of uh, kind of female creative activity. The materials that were chosen for this are all what traditionally would be associated with craft materials, which of course is the invisible legacy of female creation. You know, women have been artists, if we were to allow crafts into the art realm, forever. But we didn't save their names, we didn't give it the same kind of status as the high arts and so forth. So, ceramic work, needlepoint, fabric dyeing, and so forth, all associated with crafts. And again, this hidden leg legacy of women's artistic contributions to the world. The imagery on the plates itself is predominantly, again, central core or vulvic imagery. This is very closely associated, again, with Georgia, I'm sorry, with um, um, Judy Chicago and early feminism, which tended to want to figure out what the essential kind of characteristics and strengths of women were. They don't think about gender in the same way that people tend to think about gender, gender over the last 20 years, and especially not in the last three or four years, where there's a great deal more understanding of gender as a kind of fluid category, or at least that's my opinion of things. Uh, and so what marks women as different, what had been esteemed of women through the ages, their procreative powers, we will hark to that imagery and recast it in the realm of grand art. So here's just a kind of pointing out some of the figures that are in here, Sojourner Truth, um, Susan Anthony, Elizabeth Blackwell, Emily Dickinson. The plates start um, in very low relief and then gain higher relief as they go around as if women are going to break out of these essentializing roles. The symbolism is very powerful. 13 is actually the number of a Wiccan coven, um, which of course is a power number in various cultural traditions. But in the West, 13 is an unlucky number. And that's again, one of these recasting of heretical beliefs by uh, you know, Judeo-Christian society of earlier traditions. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I know I would have preferred to do it face-to-face, uh, -face, but please come to class when we finally meet face-to-face -face with any questions you have, and we'll pick those up then.